Hi, my name is Pete Moore from uh, Case Western Reserve University, and I'm a member of the Northeast Ohio Consortium for Middle East Studies. Hello, I'm Amani Jamal. I'm an associate professor of politics at Princeton University, and I work on pol the politics of the Middle East. So we're quite excited to have Professor Jamal uh, as our fourth speaker in this series, New Perspectives on Muslim and Middle Eastern Societies. And we're particularly excited about your visit because the goals of this project have been to engage our community in a broader conversation about the Middle East and, and the Muslim world. And in particular, we wanted to have the types of conversations that explore these communities in a broader context. And your research in particular is, is quite useful for this because Professor Jamal has done a lot of work on civil society, democratization, and citizenship in the Middle East. But she's also led and participated in a number of major research projects on Arabs and Muslim Americans in the United States. And we're particularly excited about exploring this aspect of getting Americans and our community to, to not think about the Middle East or Arabs or Muslims as sort of geographically defined. That these communities in today's world in many ways are transnational. And in particular in the American context, we wanted to explore some of the different aspects uh, of what these communities um, have gone through and what their experience has been uh, historically. So Professor Jamal will be uh, participating in two events that explore both aspects of her research. Uh, and so we'll first talk about uh, your first event on February 9th at 6.30 p.m. at the Islamic Center of Cleveland and Parma. Uh, the title of that event is uh, A Community Conversation charting the Arab and Muslim American experience. And then we'll talk about your, your second event on February 10th. Um, but I wanted to first ask you uh, the question of what constitutes diversity in the Arab and Muslim uh, communities in, in the United States. Because I think often Americans view um, Arab or any ethnic and minority communities, they view them as monoliths sort of, right. they're all the same. And I think starting a conversation about exploring that diversity uh, would, would be helpful. So what, what is diversity in, in the Arab and Muslim American context? So the, the let's break down those two concepts, um, Arab and Muslim. I mean, there's this often uh, a, a, a presumed assumption, if you may, Pete, that the Muslim population is the Arab population in the United States and the Arab population is the Muslim population. Uh, we know that about 70 or 60 to 70 percent of the Arab American population in the United States is of Christian origin. And so Muslim Amer Arab Americans constitute the minority group of the Arab American population. So that's the first type of uh, nuance or at least are uh, trying to better understand the issues of diversity in the Arab American community. When we move over to the Muslim American community, there you have uh, diversity par excellence, if you may, right? There's over 80 nationalities that constitute the Muslim American community in the United States. The largest group is not an immigrant group, in fact, it's the African American Muslim community, which is an indigenous American group. And they constitute about 35 to 45% of the Muslim American population. The second largest segment of the Muslim American population is the Southeast Asian or the South Asian. Um, and they're roughly around, at around 25 to 30 percent. Then you have the Arab Muslim population, which is about 20 of the, the Muslim population. But um, the Muslim American community, you know, basically has its origins across almost all continents, um, from Europe to Africa to Asia, uh, of course, but not. So it's a very diverse community. Now, even within the Muslim American community, there's also a lot of diversity, just like you find in the Christian population and the Jewish population in terms of how religious the community is. Uh, there, are, there are, it, it, It's a, a very, again, a multifaceted community where you have a lot of people who observe, but you also have a lot of people who do not observe. So you can't really, uh, uh, you know, basically say it's a monolith in terms of religious practice or observance or belief systems and whatnot. And then we, even within... Uh, observe the, the Muslims who do observe the faith, there's a lot of diversity. You have Sunnis, you have Shias, you have Sufis, you have people who, who practice more rigorous, rigorously, people who don't. So again, this is just trying to give you an overview of the diversity of the communities. And, and these are old communities too. I think also Americans tend to think of, you know, all of these Arabs and Muslims came after 9-11 or slightly before 9-11. 
<clears throat> right, absolutely. Like they, they, they weren't well known to the mainstream population until after 9-11. <clears throat> the truth of the matter is the Muslim American community has been here uh, for, for centuries right now. Um, of course, that community has grown as immigration laws have fluctuated. So has ha, and as other immigrant communities have grown as a result of different immigration laws. This also applies to the Muslim and Arab experience, right? Um, but if you look at the er the earliest Arab immigrants started trickling into the United States in in the late 19th century, so they've been here for a very long time. Now we're talking about third and fourth generation Arab Americans in the United States. Having said that, Pete, it's also true that a good segment of the Muslim American community has come to the United States after 9-11. Oh. Um, so about 40% of the Muslim, at least according to the, the most recent Pew uh, Research Center survey on Muslim Americans, they estimate that about of the Muslim American population um, arrived in the United States at, sorry, after 1990. What was that percentage again? About 40%. Oh, wow. So in, in many ways, it's a very old community, Pete, mm -hmm. but it's also a very new community That's good. as yeah. well. Um, one obviously mentioned 9-11 that seems that looms large uh, in American uh, popular culture and, and our historical memory is as, as shallow as it is sometimes but um, what has been the change I know that before 9-11 many of the issues of Arabs and Muslims in, in terms of their problems in the United States their aspirations and opportunities um, has 9-11 made, um, in what ways has 9-11 uh, made a difference, uh, how the United States government reacted to 9-11 versus uh, issues of continuity in the community? So the, 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 there are points of continuity, Pete, and there are points of, if, if, if you may, discontinuity, like breaks. I mean, 9-11 was an enormous shock to the Muslim American community, as, as you know. Um, uh, you know, this is a community that was was and still is doing quite well for itself. If you look at all socioeconomic assimilation indicators, the Muslim American community is doing slightly better than the mainstream population, better than a lot of the other immigrant groups in this country. So that's something that the Muslim American community is very proud of, and it's very, I guess, uh, eager to guard that status in the United States. Then you have something like 9-11, which really just throws the whole community off guard. And now the community is be being, quote unquote, implicated and this massive conspiracy um, of terrorism that's you know being that's coming in from abroad. So of course this has had an enormous toll on the community. It's really put the community back. This is a community that was really coming into political identity, coming into mainstream political participation, coming into finding a voice, uh, you know, lobbying, becoming American, if you may. And then to have something like 9/11 happen, it off base, and the point you know to the point where basically. Most of the community resources today, Pete, are being directed at issues of discrimination, stereotyping, trying to improve the Muslim American, um, the Muslim American, uh, you know, ha representation, if you may, in the United States. And that, that's that almost all segments of the Muslim American community have, uh, have basically now embraced because they've realized that for the longest time there was this idea, well, you know, the mainstream American population understands that, the, you know, terrorism is the act of these few radical individuals. By and large, this is a community that has just, you know, has worked very hard, um, sees itself as American, it sees itself just as any other, uh, you know, uh, segment of American society. And they kind of had faith in that, in that uh, spirit. If you, lo and behold, 11 years after 9-11, when we look at public opinion data today, the average American is far more distrustful of Muslims today than they were at the eve right after 9-11. Wow. The average American it basically believes it's okay to be anti-Muslim and to be vocal about it. And you look, you see now that, you know, political parties are mobilizing in the open, embracing these anti-Muslim platforms and our, you know, national leaders, local leaders, nobody's really standing up Pete, right. to say, you know what, this is not American anymore, right? I think that's a good um, point. So, yeah, this is... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, that, I think the idea that it, it wasn't, we, we often speak in this language that 9-11 did things, right? And, it, and what you're right. suggesting is it wasn't 9-11 that did that. It was, the, it was American society's reaction, the U.S. government's reaction that has inculcated these ideas. If, if right after 9-11, the levels of distrust and fear and suspicion were lower than they are now, it suggests that um, there, there's been a lot more going on than just the... the you know, the cataclysm of 9-11 that did these things. 
I mean, in your Absolutely. research, you, um, in your research, you had talked about this process of racialization um, of, of right. Arab Americans and Muslim Americans. What is that? Can you briefly describe that? Basically, the process of racialization, Pete, is the the ability to differentiate yourself to say, look, at I'm different from these other people, these the, the, these other whoever the other might encompass, and I'm different, more or less, just to simplify. Because I see myself as superior, and I see that other group as inferior. And once you begin to have this relational dynamic between you and the other, it's in in essence a racialization racialization process. And what we do in the volume is we we we, we argue that it's not simply about phenotypical differences. It's mm -hmm. not that you're white versus black. It's basically this whole idea that you know you're of a superior culture or of a superior religion or of you've privileged yourself and placed yourself on some sort of pedestal, and then you look down. And, and this type of interaction then structures the racialization process, right. which 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 in my opinion explains why 11 years after 9/11, it's okay. To, to get away with the type of public display of anti-Muslim sentiment that we see today. Right. Or, or in the paper the last few days, the uh, New York police video, uh, uh, the, the scare video about Muslims that was shown to police recruits uh, in New York City was quite alarming. It, it's very it's remarkable, Pete. Um, again, you know, these are the, the worst of the stereotypes that are being packaged together in these videos. And not only is it shown in, 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 you know, to police officers training, um, but we understand and we hear that these are being circulated and paid for by certain, you know, groups to, to, to just basically increase the Islamophobia, right. levels of distress and mistrust among the general population in ways to influence voting outcomes, right? So it's becoming even, and that's entering into these presidential debates or these congress. Um, and nobody's really talking to the Muslim community. I mean, you know, again, CARE is doing a lot. I don't, I don't want to take that away from them. But CARE And if we've learned anything from the last 11 years, what we're seeing in, in the United States with Islamophobia, Pete, is something that the Muslim American population on its own is not going to be able to address. That's a good this point. Is an, this is a mainstream issue. Right. I agree. Uh, going forward, what... Uh you know, either more positively or, or somewhat more cautiously, what are the what are the issues going forward in the near future uh, for the community? Well, the, for for the communities, I think it, there's going to be a lot of more of the same in terms of uh, you know this post nine eleven period, which is, which on the one hand, you know, Muslim Americans want to step up and continue doing what they're doing, which is basically participating and working with officials. And, and, and security and whatnot to be a force against um, terrorism in the United States. But on the same side of it, the institutions have to reciprocate. What you're increasingly seeing, Pete, is that even while Muslims have participated and engaged and embraced, you know, uh, basically local partners in, in, in terms of fighting the good fight, if you may, there's still a lot of suspicion that, that looms large. And that suspicion in of itself is creating pockets of marginalization. And so that's the challenge. And so, again, this is why I say it's really no longer a Muslim American issue only. It's really about how mainstream society responds. And what we're seeing in the mainstream society today is not reassuring. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about your second event. Um, Friday, you'll be participating in the City Club's Friday Forum. Uh, everybody in Cleveland knows about this uh, this venue. It's very very well known. Uh, and your talk's title is quite provocative: uh, "The Future of the Arab World: Pro American Democracy or No Democracy at All." And I and I and this this project is based off your forthcoming book. So um, maybe give us a, a little bit of an overview what what this research uh, is about. So the research project starts out. With with a beat that, uh, you know, political scientists who work on the Middle East, like yourself and myself, we often ask ourselves, why haven't we seen more democracy in the region? And so one of the things that I wanted to explore in this book is what are citizens, what are ordinary citizens think when we talk about democracy, what democracy means? Maybe they don't find or believe that democracy is useful to them. Maybe they have different definitions, of the, this is the citizens in the region. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have different conceptions of democracy. And so you know, Pete, that I do a lot of public opinion work, and I do a lot of ethnographic work on the ground. And what I found is, lo and behold, there's across several states, there's a lot of appreciation for democracy. 
people understand the basic tenets of democracy. People actually desire to have democracy. But they also understand that their country is more entrenched in a world economy or a world, uh, a, a global system, if you may, which really privileges the role of the United States in these countries. So I went back and I you know, started looking into international relations theories and paradigms and whatnot, and lo and behold, when we break it down on economic and security dependence, which basically are the two dimensions of international dependence, right? So if we think about whether or not a country is dependent on some type of international patron, if you may, mm -hmm. or let's put it more simply, are Arab states dependent on the U.S. for security and economic assistance? What you find since the downfall of the Soviet Union, Pete, the Arab world has become the most dependent region on the United States in the post-Cold War era, right? Wow. For security yeah. And economic, economic security dependence and economic dependence. And so the citizens of the region are basically saying, yes, we want more democracy, but we understand that we have opposition movements that don't like the patron, and the patron now has become very, very to sustaining our standard of, of living What's the and our way of life. The patriots. Ah, yes. Become integral right? to the support of these systems. Absolutely. Right. So we have, have these anti American, like Islamists who might jeopardize our relationship to the United States. And therefore, we're very cautious about the extent to which we're going to pressure or move towards more democracy. So now in Egypt, yes, you had the protest movement. Yes, you had Mubarak removed from power. But now we're in this kind of equilibrium or the status quo, quo situation, Pete, where does the military step down? Are you going to see expanded democracy? And lo and behold, what's one of the major issues that has emerged as structuring those debates. Will the Islamists jeopardize Egypt's standing in a regional and global perspective? Will it alienate, for example, you know, regional, will it be less cooperative with the United States? Will it be an ally to the United States? And citizens in, in Egypt are taking notes too. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're basically figuring out or trying to, uh, uh, you know, trying to figure out what the best route to democracy is the, and, and while saying that, you know what, if we have to take a little bit more time to get to democracy, so be it, because we need to ensure the viability and the well-being of the nation. Interesting. So, they, so that's so, the argument of the book. Yeah. So, so, so there's, there's broad recognition at a citizenship level of the, of the costs or the impediments uh, to certain to certain aspects of democracy, uh, a more independent foreign policy, um, different rules on capital mobility, for instance. So that's that's interesting. I mean, so so the idea then is in in your research, uh, there is this uh, recognition to go slow in terms of this, or does this? I mean, because one could also think that it also further entrenches opposition, uh, it, you know, domestically. It, it gives you a stronger basis to run against whoever's in power because they're not willing uh, to stand up to the United States or to do these types of things that may not meet the international agenda. That's absolutely right on target, Pete. So there's this either slowing down, like, you, you know, we're all Democrats, but we're going to take it easy here. You know, we want gradual reform for us versus this now the Islamic, Islam, or for the, the opposition is becoming more entrenched and more popular because it's seen as taking these popular stances against quote unquote like US imperialism or US dependence and whatnot. And that's why I argue in the book that a democratization agenda, given the dynamics and the contextual dynamics of the Middle East, needs to go hand in hand with a reduction of, of the sources of anti Americanism in the region. So if we have an audience effect type of model mm -hmm. where for example, Islamists are able to, 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 to win support from those who share anti-American sentiment. Well, if U.S. policies are seen as more benevolent in the region, it's going to be that much more difficult for people to mobilize on anti-American platforms. And so when you see the pendulum swing that way, there will be a, a larger coalition of the population than saying, you know what, we're pretty pro-American anyways. There's no jeopardy going on with our international or regional alliances. Let's move forward. But the you have to kind of address the sources of anti-Americanism. Sure, sure. Well, that, you know, may, maybe in the next administration, you might find yourself a position to help out in that. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> or I can still continue doing interviews on Skype. That's with true. Good, with, right. good, uh, with good colleagues, yeah. <laughs> well, th this has been great. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time, and we're very excited uh, about your uh, events and your arrival here. And so, um, again, February 9th and 10th, Professor Jamal will be here, first event at the Islamic Community Center of of Parma at 6.30. Uh, the second event will be the Friday Forum at the City Club starting at 12. Information about all of these events are at the Civic Commons uh, New Perspectives uh, site we have with all the information where this Skype interview will be uh, archived. So thank you very much and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Pete. Thank you for having me and I look forward to my visit.